ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. And thank you for subscribing to the latest edition of the 12 Kyle podcast. I'm 12 Kyle. Check this out. <laughs> On this podcast, what I'm going to do is go back a little bit. Um, I always say like with this podcast, you know, a lot of times you'll hear me talk about how things used to be. And I was driving the other day and, and it kind of hit me like, when I think about where I was at a certain point in time in a particular time frame, it's like, wow, it, it didn't really feel like that. Just to give you an idea, like I was driving and I was thinking about the nineties. Right. And I'm like, yo, like 1992 was at the time of this recording 30 years ago. And it's wild and bugged out because it doesn't feel like it's been 30 years. Cause I really remember the nineties literally like it was yesterday. Right. <laughs> I mean, I graduated from high school in 1991. So I've been out of high school at the time of this recording, almost 31 years. And that's bugged out to me because I remember every single detail about high school and my senior year of high school and so forth and so on. But it just got me to thinking about the nineties and the nineties, the nineties were just different. Um, my man, Baylor, Baylor, the great shout out to BTG, my boy. Um, he said something, he said, you know, that my podcast is kind of like a time capsule. And I really appreciate him saying that because in essence, a lot of times it is when I, especially when I'm talking about, you know, you know, a time that I saw, and maybe some of you never saw, uh, now me and Baylor, we do agree the eighties were, man, the eighties were off the chain. Eighties were special. And the 90s were special too, but it was just different. And, and the reason why I say it's different is because the 90s was really the last era or the last decade without the advent of, you know, technology and the internet and so forth and so on. So anyway, long story short, what I wanted to talk about on this podcast was just how different the 90s was. There's some things that we did in the 90s that you just don't do today. Um, case in point, I wasted a lot of time. <laughs> I wasted a lot of time listening to the radio. And what I mean by that is I spent a lot of time listening to the radio, waiting on my favorite hits to come on so I could record them and make a tape. And it was like the ultimate mixtape. So if you're listening to the radio and you are waiting on Biggie to come on, or if you're waiting on LL to come on, or if you're waiting on Ice Cube to come on, whomever, the thing about it is, is that without the advent of technology, you don't have, you know, music at the push of a button and you don't have it at the tip of your finger. So you were totally unequivocally dependent upon radio to provide music for you other than the music that you purchased for yourself right so what i would do and what a lot of kids my age would do they would get cassette tapes you would get yourself a cassette tape and you know before we moved over to cds uh in the 90s we would just you know you would listen to the radio and you would put your tape on record and hit pause <laughs> and from that point on it would just sit there and you would listen to the radio and then when one of your favorite songs came on you hit the pause button and it would actually record and, and the thing about it was <laughs> we tried to make sure that in our recording process that we weren't um getting the dj talking about the song like we didn't we didn't want that to happen. What we wanted to do was make sure that we were able to record it and then not hear the DJ DJ talking. Because who wants to have a DJ talking? <laughs> you don't want the DJ talking all over your tape. So that's not something that we do now because obviously now, you know, music music is at your fingertips. Uh, you know, 
even something as simple as, you know, going to the record store, um, you know, to buy a tape or an album or a CD for that matter. You know, now you don't have to leave home. But I just remember making tapes um, and then ultimately moved over to CDs. But, you know, sitting there listening to the radio, wasting a lot of time, because, again, you don't know when the song that you like is going to get played. You have no clue. So you literally could sit in your room listening to the radio for hours at a time. Now, if if you were listening to the uh, <laughs> if you were listening to the quiet storm, <laughs> you were almost guaranteed to, uh, you know, hear one of your favorite slow jams. But, you know, if you're trying to you know make a hip hop tape, good luck, because, of course, you know, there were quite a few radio stations um, for a long time in the 90s that didn't even really play hip hop. And when they did play hip hop, it was at, you know, a certain hour, whatever. I wish that I had an opportunity to listen to, you know, cats like Stretch and Bobito, uh, who played, you know, music and had artists come through their radio station in New York. But again, we didn't have the Internet. So I heard about them and I heard their tapes eventually, uh, but didn't know anything about it. Couldn't see it firsthand. Um, what else? Um, oh, <laughs> here's another thing we did in the nineties. Recorded voicemails. That's right. You spent time, <laughs> a lot of time making sure that you had the dope recorded voicemail. And normally when you did that, it had to be on point. It had to be a certain amount of time it couldn't be too long and normally it sounded a little something like this hey yo what's up you've reached my voicemail I'm not able to take your call right now. So do me a favor and leave me a message. And I'll get back with you as soon as I can. So at the beat, you know what to do. Peace. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah, that's how it sounded. And I mean, like almost always your voicemail, you tried to throw on a little slow jam in the background. Um, <laughs> fellas, we tried to sound, you know, <laughs> as deep as we could in our deep voice, uh, like no dudes wasn't going to be calling us. Um, and, you know, this was before the advent of, you know, technology like the, um, you know, the caller ID. So when someone called you, you know, you didn't know who was calling you. So you basically had to just leave that voice, <clears throat> excuse me, leave the voicemail like that. But what was interesting was, you know, you'd have those, you know, deep voice voicemails and then your mom would call. Hey, hey, what, what's going on with this voice? <laughs> who are you trying to get? <laughs> Shout out to mom. Um, But yeah, we, we would spend a lot of time rehearsing your best voicemail mess phone um and the voicemail was you know it was it was a cassette almost in, in essence a cassette tape recorder basically that was right there that was hooked up to your phone and when the phone rang if it rang i don't know four or five times people could leave you a voicemail on an audio tape and they would leave but that would be the first thing that they would hear would be your voice message so you know depending on who it was, you know, you really tried to <laughs> put some work in when it came to creating a, a voicemail. Um, what else was different? Oh, this, this, what else was different about the nineties? Um, I remember doing class projects and schoolwork and everything like that. And because you didn't have like your own personal computer because we were broke, if you were lucky enough to have a word processor, you were in there. But, you know, 
we saved everything that we had on a floppy disk. And then, you know, eventually we graduated to, you know, the the, the harder disk, but it, they were still, I mean, we still consider those floppy disks as well. Um, but everything was saved on a disk. And, you know, it wasn't like, um, it wasn't like now where you can save everything on your hard drive or anything like that, because what if, you know, I had to type up a paper, I typed it up on my word processor and, and the word processor is going to hold everything, but you got to have some place to save your work. So we save stuff on floppy disk. I don't even know. Do they even still make floppy disk? You know, I, I'm not even sure if they still make floppy disk, but, um, Everything was on that disc and you had to, you know, make sure that you took care of it. Uh, that's where, honestly, where a lot of music was stored too on, on disc and everything like that. So um, it's always bugged out to see those discs these days. Cause it's like, wow, we've come so far. Um, what else was different in the nineties? We also did, which I'm, I'm about to tell you about something we used to do that was really, really dumb. And it didn't really make a lot of sense, but in, in our minds, it made sense. Um, blowing in your cartridge of your video game. Um, let me give you a scenario. Let's say you go to play your uh, Sega Genesis or your Nintendo. Uh, and for whatever reason, the game isn't loading up, right? So what we would do is if the game wasn't loading or if it was frozen or whatever like that, we would take the cartridge out because you, you actually use the cartridge, not a CD. And we would blow <laughs> into the cartridge and then put it back into said Nintendo or Sega and attempt to play. Now, I don't know that that ever worked. But it did work. I don't know what the science was behind it, but like maybe the cartridges collected dust. I don't know. I some I, we you had to have seen somebody do it once before for you to do it, because I remember doing it quite often. But normally, most often times, it didn't work. But it was something that we did. Like I don't. I don't. <laughs> I really don't have a logical explanation for it, but we did that. Um. But yeah, blowing into your cartridges uh, for your video games to get them to work. Um, that was something different that we did in the 90s. You know, by the time, you know, the 2000s rolled around, you know, the, everything had kind of graduated towards disc and CDs and that type of thing. But um, yeah, it, it was it, that's that's what we did. Um, and I forgot to mention earlier, another thing that we did is as far as tapes were concerned. Um, if your tape ever popped, <laughs> you were in trouble, Jack. <laughs> One of the things that my kids, maybe some of you who are listening will never understand how to do is when that tape either popped or got tangled, your cassette tape. And you had to get a pen or a pencil to try to reel that thing back in. Oh, man. I knew a couple of people who could do that and do it to perfection without damaging the tape. And if you could do that without damaging the tape, you probably could have won a Nobel Peace Prize. You could have been voted scientist of the year because it, it takes a delicate hand um to salvage your tape and not destroy it cuz think about it like this if i go buy i don't know the new mary j blige tape i'm buying i'm buying what's the 411 right and it's what 92 that came out in 92 so i bought a new what's what's the 411 tape and i'm playing it in my car I'm rocking riding around campus of south carolina state university and let's just say, lo and behold, I go to take the tape out and the tape is kind of stuck in my tape deck. And so I pull it and the tape, you know, is tangled between my hand and the car's tape deck. 
<laughs> oh, we got a problem <laughs> because I've spent $10 on this tape and I cannot afford to have Mary J. Blige's tape be messed up. And I also can't afford to go buy another one. So it's, it's like you're in a dilemma. So you pull it when you finally pull the tape out. You have to be very careful because if you pop that tape, the tape is done. Now, I knew a couple of people that knew how to splice tapes, but if you splice a tape, meaning like you kind of connect the tape after it's been uh, torn, um, it doesn't really play the same. So, you know, it's not really worth it going through the trouble, if you will. But nah, man, I spent many a times <laughs> with a pencil in my hand trying to fix those tapes because, again, if you took the time to make a slow jams, get the draws tape, <laughs> or you took the time to make a hip hop tape off the radio, or if you just had a tape that you bought from your favorite recording artist, you cherished and relished those music wasn't disposable back then. You had to keep it. So you did everything that you could to keep it and keep it alive for you. You know, when I said, you know, talking about his tape pop, I'm sorry, when, when Biggie said he, he um, let his tape rock till the tape pop. And then Nas says, never, never, never put me in, never put me in your box if your shit eats tapes. You knew once that electronics, be it a tape deck or your car tape deck or whatever the case may be, if it was eating tapes, you couldn't use it anymore. Or you couldn't play it in your your in that particular deck anymore. So just imagine having a boom box and your boom box is eating tapes and tearing up tapes. You can't, it's, it's of no use. The only thing you can use it for is the radio. And that really happened. <laughs> um, I talked a little bit of earlier about phones. What else was different in the nineties was um, depending on where you were, private phone calls were pretty much non-existent. <laughs> the reason being is that like, you didn't really have a lot of cordless phones. So, you know, you probably had that cord, you know, a, a phone with a cord with that long ass cord <laughs> that stretched like from the living room to the bathroom, if if you were lucky. Um, and so you weren't able to like have private conversations with people uh, because more often than not, you're sitting in a room and somebody else is in the room and you can't be private with your conversation. Now, some of you may have been lucky enough to have a, a phone in your room. That didn't come for me until I got to what I was. I think I was a junior in high school. Yeah, I was a junior in high school. So that was 1990. Um, no, I take that back. I think like my senior year, that was when I first got a phone in my room. But and I mean, it was still the house phone, but it was like I had my own personal phone in the room. But I remember like <laughs> the phone would ring and, you know, I get a phone call and it's a young lady who wants to talk to me. And I got to sit in the living room where my family is watching the Cosby show. And I got to talk to her like while I'm on the phone, like there was no privacy. Like, so my mom is literally in the same room. So I can't say nothing fresh or. <laughs> I can't, you know, get loud. Um, and that happened. And I mean, like, depending on the layout of your home, yeah, you you probably weren't having, you know, uh too many private conversations. Now, if you if you graduated to the point where you had a phone in your room, then yes. But um even then, if you didn't have your own line, and, oh man, you know what was dope when the girls had their own line. I didn't know too many girls who had their own phone line, but I knew a few. Um, and that was dope because that means you could call them at any time. Because, like, we had this thing where my mom was like, look, don't call nobody past 9 o'clock. She was like, I don't care if you're on the phone. And, you know, if you're on the phone at 8 o'clock and then you get off the phone at midnight, she was like, that's different. But she had this thing about, you know, you don't call anybody's house you know, past, I know it was it nine. No, it was, I think it was 10. Yeah. I don't call anybody's house past 10 o'clock because the thought process is, is that if you call someone that late, you know, when they hear the phone ring, they're thinking it's bad news. So 
And so subsequently, subsequently, we had the same policy in my house. So I couldn't take I couldn't get a phone call after 10. Um, and I wasn't supposed to call anybody after 10. Of course, I <laughs> I mean, I mean, I broke that rule. <laughs> um, especially when I could call the girls who didn't have I mean, who had their own private lines. Um, what else? Uh what else was different in the 90s? Oh, speaking of phones, how could I forget? Uh, <laughs> phone books and yellow pages. <laughs> Listen up, kids. Pull up a chair. Um, the way that you looked up someone's number back then in the 90s was a little thing called the phone book. You know how, like, you have your contact list in your cell phone and so you can look up anybody's name who you have saved in your phone um in the 90s it wasn't that easy like if i wanted to call jeffrey i had to you know and i didn't know jeffrey's number i literally had to know jeffrey's parents names because or at least the street because in the phone book it was listed by, you know, husband or wife name or man or woman's name in the phone book and then their address and then their phone number. So all of that stuff was public information. If if you're if you had a public phone number. Now, if you had a private number, then you paid a little more, but the number wasn't listed uh, in the phone book. But everybody else's number was listed. Right. So <laughs> if I did, if I was trying to reach Jeffrey, and I knew his dad's name was Jeff and their last name was Smith. Now, Jeff Smith is a pretty common name. So now I got to go to the next level, which is what street do they live on? Oh, Jeff lives at 123 Main Street. OK, so now I'm looking in the phone book. Boom. Jeff Smith, 123 Main Street, 667. That's the number. Right. Um and the yellow pages the yellow pages were just that it was it was a big book and the pages were yellow and in the yellow pages you were able to look up businesses so if you wanted to reach out and find a dentist uh you looked in the yellow pages if you wanted to see uh you know find out the number to your favorite mechanics uh, mechanic shop um it was in <laughs> it was in the yellow pages um i, I don't I would venture to say that they probably don't make phone books and yellow pages anymore. Um, if I'm wrong or if you know of some place that does, let me know. Because I, I I saw one the other day when I was uh, back at my mom's house and I, I was bugging. I was like, wow, this is dope. <laughs> um, What else is different from the Oh, the 90s. I mean, it goes without saying, but there was no GPS. So in the 90s. You had no smartphone, so you had to ask for directions. When's the last time you ever, especially nowadays, when's the last time you asked for ask somebody for directions? You'll ask them, hey, what street is it on? And you'll put it in your little GPS and you'll find it. Um, but yeah, back then, um, you had you actually, if you were trying to go somewhere and you weren't familiar with where you were going, you had to ask someone. And I mean, like, I can only imagine being in like Manhattan and you say, OK, well, how, how do I get to Broadway? And then, you know, you ask somebody on the street, how do I get to Broadway? Oh, well, you, you turn on the avenue of, avenues of America and you go left and you go about five blocks and you turn right. And it's a whole bunch of direct. I mean, a whole bunch of directions and you still don't know what the hell you're going. And that's how it was. But. You know, now with GPS and everything, I mean, like I said, you don't have to talk to anybody. And I always found it interesting when people would ask me for directions. More often than not, I would give them the correct, you know, directions. But like you got people like my boy Jay Fresh, who was notorious for giving people the wrong directions. <laughs> I don't know why he's just an asshole like that. But yeah, Um what else is different in the 90s? Oh, in the 90s, you could actually apply for a job in person. Because, <laughs> again, no Internet. I mean, like you if you went 
to, let's say, McDonald's and you wanted to work at McDonald's, you would go and get an application in person and you'd probably fill it out in right there on the spot. Boom. Hand it to the manager and, you know, they give you a call back or whatever like that. You know, now, I mean, you try to picture going in someplace and, <laughs> hey, y'all got any applications? <laughs> what you look like going to Chick-fil-A asking for applications? They're going to, they're going to, everybody's going to direct you, hey, go to our website and, you know, apply there. Nobody, you can't do anything in person like that anymore. But yeah, there was a time in the 90s where we actually could apply for jobs in person. <laughs> as strange as it may sound. Um, yeah, nowadays, like I said, everything is online um, and people would really look at you funny if 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 um, if you if you went in some some type of establishment and ask for a paper application that to fill out. They, they probably, the hell they might throw you out. <laughs> um, what else was different in the nineties? Um, obviously many of you know, I, I, I spent part of the nineties in college at South Carolina state university. I was there from 1991 and graduated in 1996. Right. And, um, the big events, uh, the big party events, those were different in the 90s. And what I mean by big party events like um, Black Bikers Weekend at Daytona, Daytona Beach. Um, I think it was, I can't remember the name of the event. It used to be in Galveston, Texas. It might still be. I don't know. Um, we had this thing on our campus. Well, actually, it wasn't on campus. <laughs> we had this thing. And I remember my boy telling me about it. It was going to be this huge party in this field, right? And the name of the party, the name of the event, there was going to be, let me just explain what it was going to be. It was going to be a bunch of cars, a bunch of music, food, um, of course, alcohol. It didn't matter to me at that particular time because I didn't drink. I, I didn't drink in college, right? And so the name of the event, don't laugh, was called Slut Fest. I know, I know, I know. That sounds, yeah, Slut Fest. Now, hear me out. It wasn't called Slut Fest as a derogatory name for the women that would be attending. This is what was told to me. It was called Slut Fest because when you drank beer, like the foam and stuff at the top of the beer, and it, again, this is just what was told to me. I, I didn't drink beer, so I didn't know any better. It was called that because like the, the top part of the beer where it's like bubbly or whatever like that foam or what have you, that was called slut. That was called the slut part of the beer. And so subsequently they named this event Slut Fest and it was held every spring in like April. And I went to Slut Fest and it was like a wild time. Like it was just a, it was this huge field. I mean, like I, it's hard to describe it, but it was like this huge field in Orangeburg uh, where we went to school. And it was just a bunch of girls, bunch of, bunch of college kids just in a huge field with a bunch of food and a bunch of, you know, barbecue and, um, Again, but I mean like kegs and kegs and kegs of beer. Most of the beer, I'm 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 willing to bet that most of the beer was probably purchased at the local legendary uh liquor store called Kick Booty. <laughs> Don't laugh. I've talked about Kick Booty on this podcast before. Yeah, there there was a legendary liquor store in Orangeburg, South Carolina in the 90s called Kick Booty booty liquors and i mean they sold beer and liquor to underage kids i mean like you didn't have to get you, you never got carded in there 
And I mean, I'm willing to bet that most of the people who bought their beer and their kegs and liquor and Wild Irish Rose and whatever, Seagram 7, every every liquor that was there and every beer that was there, I'm pretty sure it was purchased at Kick Booby. Um, but yeah, Slut Fest, man, it was just one big-ass party. It was just one big-ass party. Um, Slut Fest might have been the first place where I saw um, where I saw bass music being played and when the bass music was played Miami bass for that matter probably was the first place where I, I saw Miami bass Miami bass music being played and then women started twerking now we didn't we didn't call it twerking back then it was just booty shake <laughs> Yeah, man, it was, it was, it was wild. I mean, but it was, it was, it was cool. And I mean, like kids from our school, kids from other schools, um, college kids, you know, from around the area, everybody came to Slut Fest. And again, I don't, I, please don't hold me to that definition because I'm not sure even to this day in 2022 that that's why it was called that, but it was called Slut Fest. And it was a good time. Uh, and I mean, of course, I can't, you know, mention the 90s and good times without mentioning Freaknik. Um, and I did a whole podcast on uh, my Freaknik experience. So um, if you haven't heard that one, be sure to go check that one out. That one's crazy uh, when you finish listening to this podcast. But Freaknik was, uh, it was right along the lines. But it was, I mean, obviously a bigger event and, you know, it was here in the city of Atlanta. Freaknik was one of the inspirations for why I <laughs> moved to Atlanta. Um, Cause I fell in love with the city and um, but yeah, Freaknik was, and I think about Freaknik every April. I mean, obviously at the time of this recording, it's April. Uh, I think about it every April because Freaknik always happened the weekend of the NFL draft. Right. And so every time I see the NFL draft, I always think about it. <laughs> Always think about Freaknik, but Freaknik was it was wild, man. I, we saw a lot of stuff, and I and I and I mentioned on that podcast, and it's worth repeating. There's a lot of stuff that happened at Freaknik that you couldn't get away with these days. I mean, like it would be nothing for you to be walking down the street at Freaknik in Atlanta and a woman grab your ass. I mean, technically that's assault, but you know, it happened. It happened to me. <laughs> I was like, hey, who touched my butt? <laughs> and and you know, and conversely, you know, especially if the women were like scantily clad or in bathing suits, you know, it they probably got felt up. You know, not saying it was right, because it wasn't right. Because you shouldn't be touching anybody that doesn't want to be touched. But, you know, a lot of wild stuff happened. Burglaries, uh, you know, assaults, all kind of crazy stuff. And, I mean, the same happened at Daytona Beach. Same thing happened in Galveston, Texas. Um, But I I never made it to those entities, so I won't touch on them. But, you know, that was a part of the 90s. The 90s was, you know, that was a wild part of the 90s, to be honest. It, It was, it was again it was different and it was really it was cool to be different because i mean you could go to a you could go to a slut fest and see all the girls that you went to school with and party and kick it with them and then you could go to freak Nick in a couple of weeks from that and see some girls that you didn't go to school with and party and kick it with them and it, and it would be cool um but yeah the the 90s were just different <laughs> Not saying it was better than the 80s or the 2000s. Not saying it was worse than the 80s or the 2000s, but it was different. And you know what? I loved every minute of it. That's going to do it for me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for checking out this edition of the 12 Kyle podcast. I'm your boy, 12 Kyle. I'll catch you guys next time. 5,000.